All right, good evening, and uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. The City Club of New York is thrilled to welcome you to this evening's webinar. We're here tonight to hear from experts about the City of Yes for Economic Opportunity, a sweeping initiative introduced by the Adams administration to reform the zoning resolution. The text is actually now in the hands of the New York City Council, who held a marathon hearing of over seven hours this past Monday. Well, if you have a penchant for self-torture, and if you listen through it all, you heard that the text has raised numerous concerns, and now council members have to decide whether they will reject the text, adopt it, and whether or whether it needs to be amended, and then to what extent. With us tonight to discuss the merits and challenges of the proposal, we have assembled a great panel. I'm pleased to introduce our panelists, starting with Michael Byrne, who is the founder and president of MJB Consulting. He is a leading expert on urban and downtown business districts, providing retail planning and real estate consultancy services for clients across North America and the UK. He is a sought after key keynote speaker and contributor to high profile publications and has served on the board of directors of the International Downtown Association. With us is also Laura Wolf Powers. She's a professor of, of urban policy and planning at CUNY Hunter College and faculty member at the CUNY Graduate Center, specializing in neighborhood revitalization and economic development policy. She teaches courses on economic development, real estate, community planning, and economic and political economy, and recently published the book University City History race and community in the era of the innovation districts. And finally, we're joined by Paul Graziano, who is a principal with Associated Cultural Resource Consultants. He brings three decades of experience in urban planning, land use, and historic preservation with a focus on community-based planning and zoning advocacy in New York City and the Northeastern United States. Based in Northern Queens, in, in North Flushing in Queens, Paul Graziano is renowned for co-authoring the R2A anti-Mike Mention zoning category, and he has been instrumental in contextual rezonings across the city, including during the Bloomberg administration. And to moderate this conversation, I am thrilled to introduce one of the most knowledgeable persons I know on the topic of land use and zoning, George James. George is a principal of George Jaynes and Associates. He brings over 20 years of ex expertise in zoning, simulation, visualization, and quantitative modeling to his urban planning consultancy based in New York City. From advising the city of New York to assisting individual citizens, George work, George's work spans a wide spectrum including his contributions, invaluable contributions, I would say, to Manhattan Community Board's review of zoning proposals and his detailed comments on the city of Yes for Economic Opportunity, the very topic of this evening. George, I really look forward to tonight's conversation. Take it away. Oh, this should be fun. I'm going to share my screen and uh, go through a few slides to introduce the ideas here. Okay. There we go. Okay, so City of Yes for Economic Opportunity. It is the largest change to how we deal with the uses in the zoning resolution since zoning was adopted, or our current version of zoning was adopted in 1961. Um, it's a major change. It's over a thousand pages of zoning text. Um, the city has broken it down into these 18 topic areas to make it slightly more digestible. Um, we are definitely not going to go through 18 topics um, at all tonight. Um, instead, we're going to go into a deeper dive into a few topics, and we're going to focus on how zoning may change neighborhoods and how we experience our neighborhoods and how specifically these zoning changes might impact them. But first, where did all this come from, right? I mean, it didn't spring out of the head of Zeus fully formed, right? Um, this is a thousand pages of zoning text. Like where did this, did this come from? Um, and it really goes back to 
2022 um, during this effort where Mayor Adams and Governor Hochul announced something called a new New York. Um, it is a self-described blue ribbon panel of experts um, who were to, selected to reimagine how and where people work. Seven months later, after they formed the new New York panel, they came out with their action plan. You see the cover right here. Um, their plan has 40 separate initiatives, mostly about streamlining regulations in New York City. Um, it calls for changes to regulations and zoning that impact how New Yorkers live and work. This plan was developed entirely by the, uh, the new New York panel and no public input was asked for and none was given. So I went through this plan and I, I found this quote in it, which I find just amazing. So this plan, quote, I'm quoting the plan here. This plan uses the COVID-19 crisis as an opportunity to harness the energy of the moment and build the city we want to be today and into the future. That means not simply reverting to the pre-pandemic status quo, but seizing this unique moment to enact transformative change. All right, so you might wanna know, who's the we in the city we want? And who's seeking the transformative change? This was not a public process, it was a private process. And of course, in true New York fashion, the new New York panel includes some of the biggest names in industry. Bankers, we're talking Bank of America, the CEO of Goldman Sachs, real estate, CEO of Tishman Spire, Real Estate Board of New York, of course. Venture capitalists, ah, Fred Wilson, you know, he's a early uh, investor in Twitter, multi-billionaire, um, tech and pharmaceutical industry, um, lots of CEOs, lots of Bloomberg administration um, alumni. That's who came up with the plan and understand that there is a straight line between the new New York plan and the city of yes for economic opportunity. Now, just because city of yes for economic opportunity is the implementation of the oligarchs plan for New York City, doesn't mean it's all bad. Uh, there are lots of things that need improvement in our zoning for sure. And certainly many of the people who develop the plans are very smart and many of them even live in New York City. Uh, but as we go into the details, we should remember that these changes were developed by people who do not have the same perspective on the world as most of us. So, some questions for our panelists to consider. How will the changes impact local retail districts? Who do these districts now serve and how will they function in the future? One of the big changes in this is the vast expansion of uses in local retail districts. We'll be able to locate most manufacturing uses in local retail districts, um, nightclubs, amusements, um, micro distribution centers for last mile delivery. We'll all be able to locate in your local retail district. How will that change their function and how will that change their, um, how residents interact with those areas. Number two, what is the future of the central business district? Um, how will these zoning changes change their future, or, you know, direct their new future, right? So the use changes will allow essentially everything to go into the central business districts, except for the heaviest, dirtiest industries, right? So manufacturing uses, Amusements, you could have unlimited size amusement park style buildings um, going into the central business districts. You could have nightclub districts, um, live music, things like that can go into the central business districts. What does this proposal do to housing? Um, is some of it actually anti-housing? It's very pro-commercial and allows for um, 
residential floor area to be used for commercial uses in the home. It allows for second floor and higher commercial to be used in mixed buildings um, that we normally just reserve for residential uses now. And then finally, the last question is, why do we plan this way in New York City? Why are we implementing plans developed by the billionaire class? Why? This is not how it's done everywhere else. What is wrong with us? Um, so those are the questions for discussion. I'd like the uh, panelists to now take a few minutes to um, talk about their issues and their perspective on the city of yes. We're going to start with Michael. Michael, can you want to share your screen? Yes. Thank you, George. Here. Oh, the uh, screen, it, I'm trying to, okay, there we go. For some reason, not able, I don't have the thingy, which, oh, okay, there we go. Which goes to the screen. Okay, sorry about that. Can you see <laughs> that? All right. All right, yep, all right. We were good. All right, thanks, George. I'm going to start with one of my favorite quotes. Um, you might recognize it from the start of the movie, um, uh, The Big Short. Uh, or if you're more literary than I, um, it's a famous Mark Twain quote. Uh, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And I think this quote actually has a lot of relevance to what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and it will thread through a lot of a lot of what I'm about to say. So first, just a few starting points to provide some context Keep in mind, uh, my uh, very narrow focus and obsession in life is retail. So I am fully aware that some of what I say uh, um, uh, might not reflect the, um, the, the many variables that go into zoning. So take that for what it's worth. Um, but just a few points uh, for context. Uh, there were a lot of throwaway comments um, uh, in 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 uh, in the plan, as well as articles written about the plan, uh, referencing the impact of e-commerce, especially during the pandemic, and how it really sets the stage for all of this. Well, let me say that there's no doubt e-commerce um, is is with us, um, but the role that it has played uh, has been vastly overstated. Um, if you look on the chart to your lower right, you'll see that in 2020 and 2021, you know, two years where you would have expected e-commerce to just completely take over, right? I mean, if ever there was a time that e-commerce was going to take over, it would have been those two years of shutdowns, capacity restrictions, public health anxieties. Well, actually, um, e-commerce as a percentage of total sales um grew by about the same amount as we would have expected it to have grown anyway, given historic trends, had there not been a pandemic, right? And that and that should tell us something, that there, there's a ceiling to all of this. Um, not to mention also that tenants, retailers, have started uh, to see stores as critical to their business models. So, uh, you know, I'm constantly seeing references to e-commerce as driving so much of what needs to happen um, in New York City and elsewhere, um, again, it's it's a bit overstated at this point. What I think's had more of an impact uh, in New York City is the contraction among some of the retail categories that have historically eaten up a lot of space in our commercial districts, specifically certain types of chain stores. The number of chain stores, according to the Center for Urban Future, um, is today almost 14% less than it was in 2019 in New York City. Um, chain drug stores, of course, being the most obvious, there were 606 among the big three in 2019. There's 435 today. Um, and that 14% does not even include the much lower number of bank branches, which have also been reducing their footprints with the rise in mobile banking. I think that actually says a lot more about why we have seen such elevated retail vacancy um, across New York City um, than e-commerce. But that said, you know, storefront vacancy in New York City, Manhattan in particular, uh, should never have been as high as it was even before the pandemic, because there's just such a high density of residents, workers, and visitors versus a severely space-constrained supply of ground floor retail space. 
In other words, the question to me, at least, has never been one of demand. You're likely used to seeing these charts that show the amount of retail space per capita in this country versus other countries. The conclusion is always that we're overstored. Well, that's not really true anymore. Even in the suburbs, um, supply and demand are in much closer equilibrium due to years of underbuilding such that vacancy rates nationwide are actually at the lowest level since at least the mid aughts. If that's the case in the suburbs, then it should be even tighter in the cities, especially New York City with the sheer number of people on the street, even yes, after the pandemic. It's the sort of market which can normally count on what I call multiple layers of demand. In other words, those vacated stores, they should be quickly backfilling. And those larger spaces like the chain drug stores, they should be readily subdivided. The question is, why isn't that happening? Or is it happening? But slowly, not quickly enough for those who have to walk by these papered over windows every day. These are important questions to consider in a rezoning proposal like this, and I worry that our senses are a bit skewed by our own biases and perspectives. Yes, there's been a lot of storied names that have disappeared or have shrunk considerably. There's no longer Barney's, there's no longer Lauren Taylor, the gap has faded into irrelevance, many cherished mom and pops have disappeared, but that's often conflated with some sort of retail apocalypse, partly because those of us who write about such things in newspapers grew up with these brands and long thought of them as fixed points in the universe. But the reality is that for all the people mourning their demise or decline, there's many more celebrating the arrival and spread of Warby Parker, of Five Below, or other new boutiques. Rather than some apocalypse, retail's been experiencing more of a changing of the guard ever since the 2010s that aligns to some degree with generational shifts. My thesis, or my worry then, is that this surety about some sort of retail apocalypse, about the inevitable domination of e-commerce, about the lingering trauma of the pandemic might be leading us astray. In communities where I've been working across the country, it has left us more susceptible to the requests of property owners and leasing professionals that the floodgates be opened to all sorts of non-retail uses in ground floor spaces, even in retail districts which were or are very likely to recover on their own, from whatever short-term pain they were or are experiencing during or before the pandemic. Some of that seems to be going on here as well uh, with what George referenced, the whole, um, the flexibility now granted to clean manufacturing uses and micro distribution hubs in, in, on, in neighborhood commercial districts, even when they have no retail presence whatsoever. With the provision now for dance studios and instructional facilities at ground floor, and I worry that it is all a premature and with certain kinds of tenants irreversible because once a well-capitalized and creditworthy tenant in these newer categories materializes, it will be awfully hard to dislodge. In some cases, I also worry that it provides an easy out for certain private sector actors, a sort of moral hazard for a lack of imagination and creativity or an unwillingness to do what's necessary to land a more traditional retail use. Don't get me wrong, in some districts where storefront vacancy has proven especially stubborn over the decades, such relaxation might be warranted. And there's no doubt that in almost all types of districts, traditional retail uses have become a bit harder to come by. But no one said that this was going to be easy. And for a long time in New York City, at least with regard to retail, it was. But times have changed. And again, this is New York City where the levels of foot traffic in a neighborhood commercial district likely exceed those for 90% of the downtowns across the country. Maybe we just need to expect more, at least in some places, in many communities, in collab, sorry, maybe we just need to accept more, at least in some places. In many communities, in collaboration with city officials, energetic landlords, and sophisticated brokers, I've been helping to develop hierarchies of districts and streets based on the leasing potential on the ground floor holding the line in some cases, providing greater flexibility in others. Part of this is a matter of thinking about how retail districts are defined from a planning perspective. To me, it should also consider, to a greater extent than it does, what the district as a whole might need in order to realize or preserve a certain kind of ground floor tenant mix. This should be based on, on a typology of districts and streets similar to the one developed long ago for shopping centers by the International Council of Shopping Centers. What specifically do I mean by that? Well, districts and streets play different roles or they have different niches retail-wise, and that's okay. Not every neighborhood commercial district is or should be the same. 
we want an ecology of these roles and niches. Some districts are for comparison shopping. That's goods we tend to comparison shop for, clothing, shoes, furniture. Some are for food, beverage, and entertainment. Some are for neighborhood conveniences. And such an ecology is what makes for a more interesting and indeed diversified city. Zoning then should be designed in a way that preserves, reinforces, and indeed helps to scale these niches, partly by ensuring that other non-synergistic uses that can generally afford to pay higher rents and would offer more credit to landlords do not present direct competition for the space. George already noted the threat that clean manufacturing can pose to local convenience-oriented businesses. Here's another example. In retail, there's this concept of critical mass, which means that put simply, whenever a district's niche focuses on one of these comparison goods, right, like apparel, shoes, cosmetics, accessories, home decor, the arrival of additional retailers in these categories typically results in returns to scale for everyone. The bigger, the better, in other words. That's why we have super regional malls. Um, but if their number, the number of these retailers falls below a certain threshold, below that critical mass, the appeal to both consumers as well as other retailers weakens and then abruptly collapses with the industry's well-known herd mentality taking hold. In other words, if zoning allows new uses that might be more appealing to landlords, it will jeopardize the critical mass and inadvertently trigger a downward trajectory. Now, some simplifying across districts is certainly called for, but the push for consistency and simplicity in this, city, in this city of yes seems to go a bit too far in a number of cases, to the point where it potentially undermines the fragility of niche. We see this on Madison Avenue, where now there's going to be provision for manufacturing, clean manufacturing, light auto repair, nightlife amusements. We see it along the Fulton Mall, where now food and beverage will be permitted on the ground floor. We see it in our neighborhood commercial districts with micro distribution, um, with, again, clean manufacturing uses like 3D printing shops. I mean, I, I do retail for a living. I, there aren't many 3D printing shops out there, at least open to the general public. Um, there might be in the future. There aren't now. So I don't know where that one actually came from, but I guess it comes from the notion that these don't have to have a retail presence, right? Um, now, to plan and regulate an ecology like this, it requires a lot of work, especially in an incredibly complex city of 8.4 million people. But not to be flippant, that's what taxes and planning departments are for, okay? Um, the last point I want to make is that there's this basic disconnect between planning and retail when it comes to time horizons, right? Planning thinks in decades, in this case, six plus decades. Retail happens in months. More than any other property type, the realities on the ground shift fast and often. The categories that want to locate in a district, the concepts and operators that are expanding, the consumer submarkets that might be tapped, the momentum that might once have been leveraged. To me, it's always seemed silly to enlist planning departments in the task of keeping up with all of it. Given how long planning processes tend to take, the new definitions and quote unquote clarifying language have often already become dated, if not irrelevant, by the time the whole thing is approved. Zoning, in other words, at least in my mind, will always be outdated and restrictive. I mean, this exercise right now has included the updating of terminology that was last done 60 years ago. It's a fool's errand. An attempt is made to update different kinds of amusements to the present day, but come on, we all know how faddish that can be, how quickly that space will move on. In effect, this whole exercise is simply kicking the can down the road until the next city of yes in 2087. Clearly there's a need for more frequent updating or an entirely new paradigm for dealing with the ground floor. I'll be interested to hear your thoughts, but now I'm going to cede the floor to the next of my excellent co-panelists. Thank you, Michael. Yes. Um, if you can stop sharing your screen. Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, Paul, um, I'm wondering if you could step up and give us your thoughts. I'd be happy to. Um, I have a slightly different take. Uh, I, I, it's, it's hard. I bow to Michael. He is an absolute genius on the retail end of things. Um, many of you know, some of you know me and some of you don't, but my background where George, George is like my counterpart in Manhattan, I'm the guy who deals with the stuff outside of Manhattan, particularly in the lower density areas of the city. And what I'm going to be focusing on today is um, more, more 
than anything is proposals number 15 and 16, because while George brought up the whole point of the, uh, the committee that was formed dealing with business, much of this overlaps with, with what was called the BLAST committee. And that was another committee created with all of the big developers, construction companies, business groups, et cetera, to turn our zoning upside down. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And um, I guess I'll do the same thing, share the screen and, and go from sure. there. So give me one second here. Uh, let's see if we can do this. Uh, can, does everybody yep. see? Yep, you're good. Okay. Excellent, yep. Let me close that. And give me one second here. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna talk about is uh, the city of Yes, uh, which in my opinion, you know, I, I consider what is being proposed both for the commercial and the housing piece, which was which was released today. I forwarded it to George earlier. Um, these are uh, rushed, illegitimate, non-planning documents. Okay, this is a an attempt by a mayor and an administration to deregulate the entire land use process and land use in general in New York City. Um, many of us worked very, very hard over the last decades to work to protect our communities, be reasonable, come up with ways where we can both have a good quality of life, allow for growth, and also protect our basic communities. Um, so let's talk about a few things. Um, I went to, I actually presented at over a dozen boards in Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx. Um, and the responses uh, to a lot of this was, I think, a bit different than Manhattan. And of course, Manhattan is its own ecosystem. And of course, it's a, a series of ecosystems, but very, very different from large parts of the city, particularly East, uh, Central and Eastern Queens, the North and East Bronx, Southern and Central Brooklyn, and all of Staten Island. Um, at the hearing on Monday, Dan Gorodnik, the chair, uh, made a big, big uh, deal about this particular slide that you're seeing, the public review timeline. And it's a very curious slide because the slide talks about the, the, the unparalleled, quote unquote, unparalleled amount of outreach that was done by the Department of City Planning to the community boards on this entire process, 175 meetings, which if you do the math, comes out to about three meetings per community board because we have 59 community boards. So that's, it's for such a, uh, for 1127 pages of text that nobody was actually shown or given in most community boards, uh, it's not that much outreach. Number two, four of five borough presidents recommended to approve the conditions, but what's missing from this page? It's something that several council members brought up at the hearing, the community boards themselves. So of the 59 community boards in the city, 21 voted yes with conditions. That's why there's a little asterisk there. 30 voted no, no, no conditions, no recommendations, no. And eight, and more curious, and this is one of the most interesting things I've ever seen in the decades I've been doing this, eight community boards simply refused to vote. They refused to vote. Now. This was brought up because the council members said to uh, Chair Gorodnik, what was the vote count and, and what happened? Because the, the, the tagline from the city and the rhetoric is all of these community boards that voted yes, we looked through them and we, we worked our, uh, their uh, recommendations, some of the recommendations into the modifications that we made to make this better. But two thirds of the boards voted no or refused to vote. And even the boards that did vote yes, many of their recommendations were not met. And by that definition, if they weren't met, then that yes turns into a no as well. So what, what we really have here, and again, it goes back to what George said from the beginning is, this is a plan not designed by communities, not referenced to communities, and only brought to communities because they must be brought to communities by law. Um, the outreach that was done by the city was miserable 
at least in Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx, and Staten Island. I can't speak for Manhattan because I was not involved. But the if I went into detail, which I'm happy to do with questions, I can tell you some of the things that I saw and participated in that were over a three decade career in doing this, I've never seen anything like it. So let's focus on proposals number 15 and 16, okay? Let's start with number 16. Now, perhaps in dense communities in Manhattan, number 16 may not be that much of an issue. Corner stores, let's look at what the rhetoric was. I wanna make this clear. This is the slide that the city sent to the community boards. It's a one sentence description with a very uh, gauzy picture of a building that might be in Ridgewood or Bushwick or somewhere in Brooklyn. Corner stores create a process to allow for small new bodegas and other locally serving storefronts in residential areas. The slide that was shown on Monday to the city council was closer to the truth. Create a process for allowing new corner stores in residential areas. Currently, zoning does not have tools to permit small scale stores in residential areas. Issue, residential areas of the city prohibit all new stores, which means new neighborhood services can never open in large swaths of the city. Proposal, create a CPC authorization to allow up to 2,500 square feet of commercial use within 100 feet of an intersection. Subject to both environmental review and community board approval, approval only if development would not create traffic congestion or environmental concerns. So let's, let's dig into this a little bit. Again, the first slide that you saw showed none of this information and it was not shared in general with the community boards. I had to go to those community boards and present to show in opposition what the city was actually proposing based on the actual text, which is right here. This is the actual zoning text describing corner stores or offices in residence districts. In fact, again, in what you just saw, they don't talk about the exact types of things that are allowed. You're talking about allowing C2 district and even office use in residential communities. So one of the things that I highlight here and, and, and George brought this up in his excellent testimony on Monday. I, I, I'm not used to giving plaudits, but he did a great job, which is this proposals number 15, 16, and 17 in particular, give sole authorization to the city planning commission to decide whether something meets their standard to give permission. Um, as someone who's deeply involved in the ULERPS process and has been involved in many, many rezonings, there's a reason that we have a system for zoning that includes the city council because the city council is the legislature of the city of New York. And by any measure based on law in the state and the city, that is the process, the bare minimum of process that should occur. But the second question is, why do we even need this in many of our communities, right? Let's go to the second piece of this, which is community board approval. Now, many of the council members questioned about this particular point because as we know, community boards and borough presidents are advisory only. Chair Garodnik was making a very big deal about how wonderful this process was gonna be because it was gonna give community boards and borough presidents the ability to weigh in and approve these corner stores, or I don't even want to say corner store, corner commercial is a better way to describe it. So council members said, well, would their votes be binding? Because you keep saying over and over again that we need community board approval. City planning will not rezone something or allow this uh, commercial use in, in this process unless the community boards approve it. Well, what if the community boards don't approve it? And over and over again, the chair kept saying, well, they are essentially, they are only advisory. They are only advisory. So it's very clear that again, if it's only advisory, it's only advisory, no matter how much we'd like it to be otherwise. So again, you're giving sole authority to the city planning commission. Now, part of the narrative from the city on this has been, 
we want to allow this because, you know, every community should be able to have this. Now, in, in my dozen meetings at various community boards around Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx, this was questioned, particularly when the issue of serious amounts of vacancies in every community board came up. You know, community board 14 had a 10% vacancy rate. Community boards 12, and this is in Queens, in 12 and 13 have 12% vacancies. Other community boards had 15% vacancies in their commercial uh, uh, strips and, and downtowns. Why would we want to encourage this dispersion of com commerce when A, it's prohibited now and people don't want it, and B, we want to try to revitalize our commercial districts. The first planner who was asked this at one meeting said, this is a deregulatory program. The second planner at another meeting said, oh, this is never going to happen. To which I responded, well, if it's never going to happen, why are you proposing it? No answer. Third meeting, that came up again, and a planner, actually one of the main people who wrote or, or shepherded this text said, There's We've had a few cases where folks have wanted to do this where we thought it was appropriate, but we didn't have any power to do that. Now, the next narrative came out in this press release the day after the City Planning Commission voted for this a month ago. This is a bullet point that's very, very interesting. Create a process to allow new corner stores in residential areas as approximately 265,000 New Yorkers currently living in areas where a new corner store could not be located within a quarter mile of their home. Well, 265,000 people sounds like an awful lot of people, but when you do the math, it's about 3% three, 3 of the population, 3%. Let's look at Community Board 8 in Queens. Community Board 8 is an area that's uh, uh, about two thirds, one and two family, and one third multifamily. Some of it is fairly dense. Some of it is more garden apartment kind of development. But it's it's a typical area in Queens or in parts of Brooklyn or the Bronx that's kind of a mix of suburban and semi-suburban and some urban areas. The southern areas on uh, the southern boundaries on Hillside Avenue, which is a very dense corridor, it was upzoned dramatically during the Jamaica rezoning uh, about 18 years ago. The west is Van Wyck Expressway, the north is the Long Island Expressway, and the east is uh, Cunningham Park and the Clearview Expressway. So when you look at this area, this is based on the commercial overlays in Community Board 8. A huge portion of this area is, is within a quarter of a mile, um, but uh, there are parts of it that are not, specifically an area called Jamaica Estates and Holliswood, which are two of the least densely populated areas in the district. Now, these areas don't want a commercial use in their very suburban single family community. As you can see, Hillside Avenue is right here. All of these folks are comfortable either walking or driving to Hillside Avenue or walking or driving, dr jumping onto the Grand Central Parkway to go somewhere, as you see, runs right through the middle of their community. Right. The zoning in the area is a mix of one family zoning, R12, R2A, uh, and, and multifamily zoning, two family zoning. That would be the R3X, R3A, uh, R4A. Those are detached two family zones. OK, so we're going to take a quick look here at an area. Here's here's a streetscape in Jamaica States. Again, for those folks who are from Manhattan or Brownstone, Brooklyn or Long Island City or parts of the Bronx, this is the suburbia of New York City, which just as an aside, when the city put out their uh, proposal, their proposed zoning text today for housing, uh, they are planning to eliminate single family zoning, which of course we are fighting vociferously against. Every single one of these squares, excuse me, are properties that are within 100 feet of a corner. So again, it's not that every property within 100 feet of a corner would be approved, but every property within 100 feet of a corner could be approved yeah. by the City Planning Commission. They made statements, oh, you need to pass environmental review, traffic studies, this and that. All I can tell you is based on the um, typical EIS and traffic studies that are done that get uh, immediately rubber stamped 
by the Department of City Planning and by other agencies, uh, that, that carries no weight with me or anybody else in most of our communities. So again, this is about creating a situation where if someone, a speculator, which by the way, is something very, very concerned in, in these mostly owner occupied communities, comes in, buys a house, buys two houses, whatever it is, and is able to build up to 2,500 square feet of commercial. Now, let's talk about how this intertwines with the housing piece, which is coming up. This is a property. Paul, Paul can I, I'm going to ask you to pick up the pace a little bit, if you uh, can. Uh, I'm almost done. Okay, I'm great. Very, very close. Yep. This is a property. It's a fairly large property, 16,000 square feet lot property. Currently, it's a one family zone. You could tear down this house and build two homes on the property, okay? Under the uh, proposed housing pr proposal, uh, this could become a multifamily ADU as of right with multi uh, multiple houses with accessory dwelling units. And if it's in a transit zone, it could become a 33 unit apartment building. And the reason I'm bringing this up is that the Proposal number 16 dovetails with this proposal. Now you have a new building, and now that owner puts in a request to the City Planning Commission to put in 2,500 square feet of space into this new building. That would be in the yellow portion, okay? So this is exactly what we're talking about, how these two pieces work together. Similarly with Campus Commercial, and I'll be very quick about this, this is not just for NYCHA campuses, which is something that uh, city planning put out there. Uh, again, it seems to be focusing on NYCHA, but the text says 1.5 acres or more. Any property 1.5 acres or more can be divided by a street, can be in multiple lots under a single ownership, can apply for up to 15,000 square feet in any residential zone. This is Bayside, Queens. This is a uh, This is Bell Boulevard right here on the right. Bell Boulevard is a commercial, major commercial area, Northern Boulevard, Bell Boulevard. This is an apartment complex built in the 50s, which are three-story residential apartment buildings, okay? That's right here. Now, based upon another piece of the housing, which calls for infill on these properties, increasing floor area, et cetera, you've now got a new building that can go on what is currently not allowed to be built on because of the FAR, and an entire ground floor with 15,000 square feet of commercial. So what this is doing is it's a combination of densification and commercialization of all of our communities. And that is my presentation. Thank you. Great. Paul, thank you for that. Um, sure. If you could stop sharing your yep, screen. I'm doing it right now. All right, yeah. super. Um, Laura, um, you're up. Okay, thank you so much to the City Club for inviting me to this um, panel. Um, I I may not, um, I think I'm gonna get a little bit more conceptual and, and broader than some of the more granular uh, material that we were just looking at from uh, from the other two panels panelists. Um, and, and I'm also, George, going to take exception to your characterization that these changes were developed by oligarchs and billionaires, because, um, you know, I, I don't think that billionaires spend a lot of time thinking about how to translate 1961 use, use groups into, you know, contemporary language. And, I, you know, they, these are pe people from the Department of City Planning. Um, and you know, many of them are my students or my former students. And like the rest of us, they are trying to make the city as good a place as it can be. I mean, I I, I truly believe that. Um, you know, I don't agree with everything they did, and there's many things that I disagree with. I also think that they could go a lot further, and and I'm going to talk about that. But um, but I do think that it was a, a good faith effort to strategically align uh, industrial and commercial zoning, uh, with an economy that has changed, um, drastically in several ways, you know, so first of all, many industrial processes are cleaner. We have the department of environmental protection today. We do not have that in 1961. Um, more people are working from home. We have an excess of office space for a variety of factors, um, and in play in-person retail. And I, I think that, that Michael, um, you know, is the retail expert, and he had a lot of important insights on on the, the 
retail piece, but I do think that where that in-person retail is playing a different role in people's lives than it did, um, you know, even 10 or 15 years ago. And the flip side of this is that we've seen the built environment change in reaction to that um, into the way new ways that people are consuming, which has huge impacts on um, the 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 built environment that we have trucks on the street, um, you know, 90% uh, percent of the delivery is done by trucks. And prior to the pandemic, according to the Department of Transportation, 60% of deliveries were to commercial establishments, while 40% were to residences. Now, currently, 80% of all deliveries are to people's homes. And what that and that's exerting really profound, the knock on effects of that are traffic, uh, really serious air quality problems, um, mobi diff difficulties in mobility. And um, and for people who live near the last mile distribution warehouse facilities, um, really devastating impacts day to day. So um, I think in part, I, again, I don't think that this proposal goes nearly far enough in sort of addressing that last mile issue, but but I think that that's a, a sort of retail reality that, that deserves, um, uh, you know, uh, some some good, you know, some people really thinking about, you know, how how do we distribute um, the environmental burdens of this new form of consumption a little bit more fairly than they're being distributed now. Um, so in looking at all the different components of the proposal, I just want to talk to speak to a few um, that stood out to me as having implications for social equity. Um, and I just have one slide, but I'm going to share it now. Um, okay. All right. Um, yeah, so the, um, the first thing um, is that, um, you know, I think that the city should have M zones that affirmatively support the city's industrial economy and its the, the industrial employment ecosystem, and that actually sort of treat manufacturing zones or or industrial zones as as places where important functions are taking place that uh, enable the city to exist and to function every day. Um, so, um, does this? proposal do that? Does City of Yes do that? I think that it starts to. Um, core M zone, the new the new proposed Core M zone, uh, places FAR limitations on all non-industrial uses. It allows increased FAR for industrial uses. Uh, it relaxes parking requirements. It incentivizes uh, industrial uses in more mixed districts. Um, you know, does it go far enough? Um, no, we have, um, there's, there's still a lot um, that can be done to support the industrial economy that this proposal doesn't address, um, but I think that it is, um, uh, you know, there, there, are, and I know there. One issue with M zones has been that, um, a, you know, a lot of, um, well, the most recent thing is that Creative Office has had a really significant displacement effect on working artists and small manufacturers that are, um, and I don't think this proposal does much to to. Uh, address that. Um, but I think I think it's a start. And for the first time, we would have an M zone that's, you know, really affirmatively about manufacturing and not about just like everything we don't want <laughs> from the other areas of the city. Um, so the second is um, moving the needle on office to residential conversions. Um, you know, we, as George mentioned at the beginning, I think we, we have a housing crisis, we need more housing. Um, and I think that this, the proposals here would uh, make um, commercial to residential conversions uh, easier to achieve um, by um, allowing mixed use buildings that contain both commercial floor space and residential floor space uh, while maintaining separation between the commercial and residential units and while uh, assuring noise attenuation and, um, you know, separate lobbies and sep uh, separate elevator banks and so forth. So, um, you know, if you have a building that um, is currently, you know, has commercial vacancy and there are many such buildings, uh, and, but you have a commercial tenant on say the seventh or eighth floor, um, but it's vacant on the second to sixth floor beneath that, you know, this, this 
provision the provision in this this proposal would enable you to create residential in the middle without displacing the commercial tenant on the top and i think that that's um you know something that would will help us I means obviously there's a lot of architectural barriers to converting um res uh, office to residential there's a lot of financial barriers but um to the extent that there are zoning barriers um i think this starts to address those um the third thing uh, i've already kind of alluded to which um is provisions that uh address the concentration of in the environmental burdens of um e-commerce in particular neighborhoods neighborhoods of color low-income neighborhoods primarily um and um some, I, someone talked about micro distribution in commercial zones. Uh, it would be enclosed micro distribution spaces um, of 2,500 square feet in C1 and C2 districts and of 5,000 square feet in C3 and C7 districts. I, I think that that is a probably a more fair way to, um, to distribute the, the costs of our convenient, you know, our newly convenient shopping uh, regime than uh, having these giant uh, last mile warehouses um, located next to people, you know, in, in people's neighborhoods like Red Hook and Sunset Park and Maspeth and the South Bronx. Um, you know, I think that this proposal, the micro distribution proposal is a net positive for traffic. It's a net positive for pollution and for time delays. And it's, and it's more fair. It, it distributes um, uh, the burden of, of, um, of this um, phenomenon uh, more more evenly, and and might might even actually make people um, think a little bit harder about <laughs> um, their shopping behavior, and because they'll see the consequences of it. Um, it the the thing is that um, you know, and I think that micro distribution is something that um, can be environmentally friendly, and um, I there's the DOT is piloting some. Uh, micro distribution micro distribution hubs um, in the city. One of them is on 35th Street, not too far from the grad center where I teach. Uh, and uh, you know, and it's it definitely is preferable to to trucks um, as a as a way of getting goods around. Um, it it's a lot easier. You know, there's a lot less carbon dioxide being spewed into the air. Um, so I I you know I support that aspect of the proposal. Um, and However, um, I think that the, the the proposal it doesn't even provide like a definition or a, a use group for last mile warehouses at all. Um, and in that sense, it's really um, by you know dodging responsibility for um, planning for the the digital economy and and its impacts on the built environment. Um, I mean, I, I think there have been proposals to have special permits um, to locate last mile distribution facilities um, that are greater than 50,000 square feet. There's been proposals to have um, to look at last mile warehouses um, to not uh, to disallow the, the possibility that there would be a kind of like entire neighborhood that would be full of last mile distribution facilities by saying that they can't be you know located next to each other um there there's also some really interesting proposals um that are uh that that would um mandate that uh large distribution warehouses located in maritime areas industrial maritime areas um would have most of their deliveries uh conducted by you know by marine transportation and that that's something that I know the city is doing some freight planning right now I know they're about to engage in a strategic industrial plan and hopefully they'll really start thinking more about how the waterways can be uh, an alternative to to the streets because um you know really people are um are breathing a lot more uh truck exhaust um you know particularly near these these facilities than, than they need to be. Um, so I will stop there. You know, I think that, uh, again, you know, I have a lot of, of um, you know, I, I, there's, there's a lot of things I take exception to uh, in what the City Planning Commission has, or the department has done here. Um, but I think that by and large, they are um, moving us closer to the kind of city that we do want. And I, I recognize that I've talked about some things that are not um 
that do not overlap with some of the concerns that were raised, uh, you know, particularly by Paul in terms of uh, commercial uses in residential areas. Well, that's fine. Thank you, Laura. Um, that was great. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to ask a couple of questions. I encourage the audience, if you have questions, to use the Q&A. Um, I'm going to take a first couple, um, and then we'll start uh, getting questions from the audience. Um, and let me let me just throw out one of my big concerns about this, and I'd like to hear your thoughts about it. Is that is that with the expansion of uses in the local commercial districts? So, you know, not only for stores and services, you can now put manufacturing uses, nightclubs, amusements, micro distribution, basically most commercial activities or, or industrial activities for that matter in your local commercial districts. Um, it concerns me because, you know, the local commercial districts were designed to serve the neighborhood, right? They're not there as job centers, right? They're not there to for economic activity. They're there so that the people who live in the neighborhood can get their hair cut, do their laundry, go to the grocery store, drug store. They, they're there to serve the local people. And I worry that, especially in marginal neighborhoods where the rents are already low, um, we'll see the migration of industrial uses to commercial centers or these commercial strips, um, largely because, you know, we've been rezoning our manufacturing land for the last 25 years and there is very low vacancies uh, in the industrial areas. And so they need room. And so that they are going to go into places in the Bronx and in marginal areas. And where are those people going to do their laundry? Are they going to get on the bus? Are they going to get on the bus with their laundry? I mean, this, I think, is like a, a fundamental land use planning question and why we do planning. And I haven't heard anybody else or anybody from the Department of City Planning even suggest that this might be an issue. Am I overreacting? Who would like to take that? Michael. Uh no, I, I agree with you, uh, George. And, you know, I, I think, Laura, you, may, you make some very good points about the environmental impact of distribution. I think a lot of my and to some degree your concerns in this regard, George, um, would have been uh, would have been solved by just requiring uses like micro distribution or clean manufacturing to include a retail component at front of store. This city, yes, does not do that. And I know when there was an explosion of micro distribution hubs, and that's a perfect example, um, an explosion of micro distribution hubs a few years ago it, during the depths of the pandemic, you know, all of these were funded by venture capitalists and there was a lot of money available to pay whatever the market could bear right, for what became dark stores. And yes, there, there were some which, you know, kind of made tentative efforts to include a retail component at the front. It was, it was the ones I saw were, were rather lame in that regard. Um, you know, I, I think that what you're saying, George, and what you're saying, Laura, it would have been a, sim a somewhat simple solution, just require some sort of retail presence. Um, for some reason, that's not in this in this in this proposal and, and i'm not entirely sure why so anyway that's just what i was gonna say so paul on to you <laughs> well very briefly the the answer is you're not overreacting george and one of the things that i'll say you know again a great example um back to the discussion of we have all these vacancies right we have all, all currently have all these vacancies how community board member ask this question. How is going to expanding home use to allow three employees, for example, and a broad set of uses going to help the commercial strips? This was the truly amazing response from the Department of City Planning. Well, we believe that people will be so entrepreneurial that they're going to do so well that they're going to outgrow their space 
And that's when they're gonna go and rent a space on a retail strip. Okay, that is directly from the top level staff at the Department of City Planning. If this is the top level staff at the Department of City Planning, we are in big trouble, very big trouble, okay? So again, let's disperse commercial use onto every property in New York City. Let's encourage development into places where it shouldn't be. Let's allow all kinds of uses everywhere. Let's not specialize and create districts that people want to go to, right? People want to go to a particular place or a particular location. Let's just let it all go out. We are not Houston. This is Houston. I don't want to be Houston. That's what I have to say. Okay. Uh, I, I actually have a question, which is, what does anybody know in a in even you talked about a marginal neighborhood uh, as being particularly vulnerable to this possibility, George? But do you know what what a average retail rent per square foot is on a, in a commercial district? Uh, you know, say I don't know Brownsville. That's a Michael question. Um, I'm not entirely uh, sure about Brownsville specifically. Obviously, retail rents uh, range very widely from the $2,200 per square foot on Fifth Avenue to, to considerably lower per square foot rents. Um, what is interesting is that, you know, the, the rents are still higher even on a Pitkin Avenue than they are in most urban districts across this country. Um, uh, but you know, they're aligned with the market, right? I mean, they're not, they're not, um, they're not necessarily expensive for, uh, for the market, for the demand. Um, um, but yeah, I, I could do some digging in the next 10 minutes, uh, for that. It's well, probably no, I, in the I double think... digit. It's probably in the double digits per square foot. I doubt it's, it's, as, it's in the triple digits, but it's probably in the double digits. Right. Well, I mean, I guess I'm just going to express some skepticism that, um, you know, manufacturers typically need, you know, they're, they're, they operate, um, you know, 24 to $30, $30 a square foot is very high for a manufacturing operation. So I think it's very unlikely that some non, you know, very incompatible use like manufacturing use is going to outbid, uh, you know, a retail use on a, on a strip. Um, I, you know, I, unless they do have a retail component now, I mean, I take the point that maybe we should just say that they should have a retail component. So we don't take the chance that some, you know, enterprising manufacturer will somehow you know, offer <laughs> the landlord $45 a square foot, but I just, it's just not a danger that I perceive like based on my understanding of, of um, the market. I mean, the commercial is a different thing, and I, I and I'm not, I'm not sure what's so terrible about having a dance studio in a first floor space, but maybe you can tell me that. <laughs> no, I, I mean, uh, I'll quickly say this because I know we don't want to get. Um, I'm not saying the dance studio or the educational institution is 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 bad in and of itself. I worry that it, and that you know that could take space from another use. Um, you know that that particular district's niche is, is more directly aligned with whether it's a dry cleaner, whether it's a laundry mat, um, and that those uses are 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 not ones which need that visibility to the same degree. Um, now, uh, the minute it, I think you, I understand what you're saying about manufacturing. How are they ever going to be able to compete for space? And 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 I think that's. I, I I think that's so that's you know typically been the case. Although these days, with you know with the sort of funding that some of some that new concepts can generate, like from venture capital, you know, and that was with the micro distribution hubs was part of the problem. They were able to outbid anyone if they wanted to because they had that money. Um, they were not really disciplined. They were not really facing. The same sort of fiscal discipline <laughs> that some other company might have, um, you know, and so with money going into those sorts of experiments, um, you know, that that was that's why I brought up that example. But anyway, I'll stop. All right, I'm going to ask another question uh, for the panelists. Uh, another one of my concerns is, um, 
it's similar to what I said about about uh, the local commercial, but it has to do with the, the the central business districts. What is the future of the central business district? So um, we are going to be allowing manufacturing uses in office buildings. We are going to be allowing um, entertainment uses. We're going to be, you know, nightclubs, uh, live shows, music. Um, we can allow for an unlimited size um, amusement park uh, in C4, C5, three C6 districts, right? Um, by unlimited size, I mean only limited by FAR bulk requirements, right? So, you know, you could have Disneyland, New York City, um, open up across the street from JP Morgan's new headquarters as of right, as of right with no special permit, no environmental review at all. Um, is it acceptable? Is it something that's, you know, we should allow for the market to determine where some of these really large, impactful uses go? Um, should uh, the city be determining the direction of their central business districts more centrally? Or is this something that's better left to the markets to figure out? Anybody? Michael. I'll talk unless either you two want to talk. I've already been talking a lot, Paul, Laura. I'm, I'll, I'll jump in for a second. Yeah, go. Okay. So, you know, it's interesting because uh, there's a big proposal. Uh, I don't remember the exact location, but I, I believe there was a big uh, proposal to put in a, a ride in a thousand foot tall new building near Times Square that was like a big drop ride. That yes. went up, right. And that's like 300 or 400 foot drop or something like that. So clearly that fits the definition of an amusement for this particular proposal. Right. Well, okay. So just to, the, the ride. That, yeah. Right? So the ride, the ride there was permitted as an accessory use to hotel. Right. Um, they did an extraordinary zoning gymnastics to get that approved. Yes. Um, yeah. And so that ride will become as of right. Uh, correct. Everywhere. Yes, now, exactly. Without and, any zoning gymnastics. Right, right, exactly. So, so again, um, you know, I'm a community-based planner. I'm someone who works with communities. I do not work with developers. I do not work with government. Well, I work with them when they cooperate and I fight them when I don't. And I don't work with nonprofits in general because they all have interests. It's their own personal and monetary interests. It's not the interests that are going to be affecting the community. So in my opinion, again, this is all deregulatory. I am not in favor of deregulation. This is not what we should be doing in this city. Layla, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on this because you know, you're know you a member of District 5 in Manhattan. Yes, indeed. Um, so, you know, I, I think that, and I want to thank the uh, the the panelists. I think you, you're providing some really in, very very insightful uh, uh, points to to this uh, to this topic that is complex. Uh, but you know, looking at it a little bit more broadly, what I see, and I would love to hear you uh, talk about, is you know, to echo what Paul is saying. Is there a trend towards deregulation? Because, you know, we see it in the city of Yes for economic opportunity very clearly. We see it and, you know, we have not digested yet the entire 700 plus pages of uh, the uh, housing opportunity uh, draft that just dropped. Uh, but, you know, it suggests that we're going into the same direction. And then separate of that, uh, in the state legislature, we have a number of bills uh, that are actually making their way that also go towards deregulation, including the uh, Faith-Based Affordable Housing Act, um, that in essence, in the text, and, you know, whether you believe that the merits are, are good or not, uh, but in the text, it basically uh, states that it would mostly entirely overall the zoning resolution. Uh, you know, provided that you comply with what is in, in the act, then the zoning of your local municipality no longer uh, applies. Um, is, is this the trend? And, you know, we, we see a, a big push by, uh, you know, mo a movement, a YIMBY movement, 
uh, that is hard at work, very well funded, very well organized, you know, in California, but also here uh, in New York uh, with, you know, some groups that have set up super PACs and that are, you know, uh, you know, bragging about the fact that they are launching multi-year, multi-million dollar effort to actually promote this vision. Uh, is this what is at play and what to do about it? So, Paul, uh, I, yeah, I'm, sh I'm sure you have some some thoughts. <laughs> yes, let me let me and let me quickly say because unfortunately, I have a a hard deadline to leave in about six minutes. Unfortunately, I, I mentioned that to George at the beginning. So, um, so yes, I mean uh, to answer your question, look, this is big real estate. This is a national movement. A lot of it is based on false uh, false statements, and they're not statement of facts. Um, this is, you know, do we have a housing crisis or do we have a housing mismatch? Do we have a retail crisis or a retail mismatch? These are two very different things, right? We have, we have been uh, just briefly, we've been in a, in a housing crisis in New York city since 1948, every single year since 1948, that's 76 years. We have been in a housing crisis as defined as less than 5% vacancy rate in the city of New York. So Population went down a million, population came up one and a half million. Now we've been down 600,000 in the last five years. It's not something that you can just make blanket statements and rewrite history to, to, to you know, curve your narrative to justify what you're trying to do. So for those of us such as myself, and I think George can be in this category as well and many other people, but George can speak for himself. I would say very clearly, this is a, a rush and a grab to get as much as people can get, to turn everything upside down, to make it very easy for them to do whatever the hell they want, period. Yeah. Laura, I, oh, go ahead, Laura. No, go. I, I, I would love to hear your thoughts, Laura. About whether this is a kind of part of a deregulatory trend? Yes. Well, I, and, and whether it is good, bad, ugly, or uh, should we be indifferent? Well, I think the zoning code in and of itself, I mean, talk about something that uh, was uh, initially uh, conceived of by by wealthy elites. Um, you know, we have a zoning code in this city that reflects the interests of the powerful and the wealthy. It, that, that is what exists. I, I think we can debate whether these particular uh, proposals on the part of the city planning department are are likely to un you know wh which things that there they will undo that are you know to kind of provide more uh, broad based economic opportunity and which which might be um, you know facilitative of um, speculation and land grabs and and kind of you know big big real estate plays that that end up ruining neighborhoods but. But I guess I don't I don't think of the the current zoning that we have as being particularly fair or particularly in the interest of a lot of communities. Um, and so I'm not so concerned about deregulating. <laughs> um, you know, it, I, I think it, it, it yeah, that that might that's my my perspective is that, um, you know, there's not. Um, you know, I do think that the that there's a lot being thrown into the kettle at one time and the, the city planning and the administration, you know, clearly they are trying to get it done quickly. Um, but I do think that there could be a benefit to decoupling some of these things from one another and looking at them separately. You know, yeah. I'm going to add, add on to that, if I may, just about deregulation. And I, and I, I do, you know, Paul mentioned the blast effort, which was, you know, explicitly uh, a deregulation effort that was about streamlining uh, processes within city government to get things done faster. And and I think it goes back to um, thinking about who regulations are for and who pays for them. So regulations are the beneficiaries of regulations are mostly regular people and workers. Um, the people that pay for them are developers, the bankers, the, the money classes. And, and yes, um, New New York plan 
was developed. Again, I, Laura, I, I will encourage you to go look at that list of people who um, sit on that panel. And there is probably not a higher density uh, uh, billionaire class outside of Silicon Valley that you'll find. And uh, they are the ones that gave the direction to streamline processes and to essentially make things easier to do. That class is the class of people who pay for regulations. The people who benefit from regulations were not in the room. And so, yes, I think when you have a situation like that, you will get a deregulation effort because the people who pay for regulations don't want to do that. <laughs> it's, I think it's as simple as that. George, uh, on that note, sorry, on that yeah. note, I have to leave. I apologize. Yeah. As I said, I had to I kind of have a hard yeah. deadline. So it's thank no you problem. so much for having me tonight. See you, Paul. Take thank care. You, Paul. Thank you. We will, we will soldier on. <laughs> Thanks. Um, if, if I may, um, I'm going to take a couple of questions from, from the chat. Um, yeah, Olive has asked a question. Um, is it really important that New York grow and become more dense? Or is open space and livability more important for its residents? And that's a, that's a very fundamental question. And what are your thoughts? Laura, do you want to take the first stab? Well, I believe Paul mentioned just a few minutes ago that we're not growing um, at the moment. <laughs> There's been a population loss. Um, and um, I think the, the sort of, I, I think you can make a distinction between sort of growth as in like income growth or population growth and sort of growth in square footage being developed. Um, I think that there's a certain mentality in the development community that they have to keep building. It's kind of what what keeps their, you know, balance sheets alive. And, and um, you know, and, and there's a lot of evidence that, that um, you know, a lot of real estate projects are um, you know, structured as, uh, you know, in terms of the finance available to them as opposed to the demand for the space. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think that I, I would like to see New York thrive. Um, and I think many people at the Department of City Planning would agree with me. Um, I think that on, on, you know, I'll, as I said at the beginning, there have been these massive changes since 1961. People, you know, more people are working at home. Um, there's, uh, you know, people are shopping differently. There are, um, you know, different industrial production looks different than it did. And so I, I would say that it's not. I, when I look at this, you know, I see something with a lot of flaws, but I see something that's not trying to drive growth per se, but is trying to adapt the zoning code to the economy that we currently have. OK. Um, so here's another from the chat. Uh, won't goods still have to be trucked to a micro distribution hub, increasing traffic in already congested residential retail corridors? Aren't last mile distribution centers typically located not just in areas with M zoning, but near highways or ports? Um, Will distributors be interested in spending a lot of money on micro distribution hubs and retail corridors? I, I, effectively, how will all of this work? Do you have any ideas? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I'll I'll take that. I think that uh, that was the other thought that I was having um, in your earlier comments, Laura, is that um, there's obviously the environmental impact question, um, but I'm not sure. If you have micro distribution hubs in neighborhoods, whether that's really going to move the needle all that much in terms of the need or demand for la for larger last mile warehouses. In fact, it's it's a model which theoretically makes a lot of sense, especially in the densest cities, right? I mean, it makes sense in New York, it makes sense in San Francisco, um, makes sense in Boston, um, theoretically. Uh, the only real evidence that it's moved forward is mostly in New York with the whole uh, instant grocery phenomenon. 
which came and went and, and, and which at least to me, the numbers never even would have come close to penciling it. Uh, to me, I was amazed that anyone thought that that could ever make money because um, groceries, everyone knows is a very low margin, low margin category. Um, and to suggest that you're going to add delivery costs to it and you're going to make those deliveries free and you're not going to have any sort of minimum order and you're going to do it in 15 minutes was it was just it was it was it was fairy tale land. So I don't know if in practice we have evidence that a micro distribution model will take hold. Theoretically, it, it makes sense. Um but right now, I think still, you know, these retailers are almost entirely still focused on larger last mile warehouses. Now, granted, ones that are closer to cities than they used to be, they're not out necessarily down on the turnpike in New Jersey uh, only anymore. They're closer, but they're not necessarily in neighborhoods. And so we'll see if that ever actually does come to pass. OK, um, we have a couple of oh, sorry, Laura, go ahead. Oh, well, I, I just would encourage you to look at the Department of Transportation's work on this, because I think they, they did look at a lot of other cities. And I think the main uh, advantage would be simply that once you get to the neighborhood level, you would have goods being delivered on foot or by bicycle or by e, you know, electric van. And um, that there that there is that there could be a benefit to people in the local residential area and hopefully and this is the thing this is one thing that the city plant the city of yes is completely silent on they are they're not trying to regulate those macro distribution centers they're they're mm -hmm. just sort of um and i but i think you if we were trying to move toward a situation where there was more micro distribution and less concentration of distribution in just a few neighborhoods where people are like literally getting asthma attacks and and spending time in the emergency room. Like, I think that 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 would be a better city. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's worth a try to see if we can design um, a a system that that, you know, that works and that doesn't distribute environmental bads um, quite as unfairly. Um, a couple of quick questions here. Um, John Massengale asked about the casinos and were they part of the city of Yes? Um, so uh, the casinos were were done as part of economic opportunities environmental assessment. And so you will, if you look at their environmental assessment, there, there's a big chunk of it is about casinos, but then it was carved out. Um, and, you know, is that a done deal and we, we have to accept it? Well, there's going to be a whole process for that coming up. Um, and it's going to involve the assembly members, it's going to be different than the processes we normally follow on that. So I think uh, stay but on, on that, George, uh, if, if you can underscore the fact that there will be no Euler for casinos. So I think it's also part of this de deregulation trend where, you know, the, the Euler has been usurped uh, and uh, casinos will be deemed as of right, provided that they have been cited by a state uh, agency or authority. Um, the you know the, the the gaming commission. So long as they have the approval of the gaming commission, the city will actually play a technical support role in uh, helping the uh, you know the design of uh, of the the casino and and you know the type of uh, you know specific use where the egress goes, the signage and all that good stuff. But it is not going to go through your. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it also feeds into the strand of, you know, deregulation or a different type of, uh, you know, regulatory approach. And the city council certainly will not have final say on uh, a casino, uh, where it goes or how it looks. Um, there was a question of, is the building code uh, planned to be reformed as well? Um, to account for zoning changes, not to my, not, not as far as I'm aware. I don't even think that blast had any changes to the building code. Um, thank goodness. Um, there's another question here from Bernadette about uh, how community boards can stress that uh, the city go back to the drawing board and, and focus on one economic opportunity for Manhattan and the rest of the boroughs. Um, so uh, to answer this, I'm just going to say, you know, this is with the city council right now. Um, if you have, and they will be voting on this one way or another by the end of May. Um, and so if you have opinions, um, pro or con, 
you need to contact your council member's office and let your council member know what your opinions are. It's the kind of thing that everybody votes on a citywide. There is not member deference in a citywide uh, zoning text amendment. Um, further, if there are things you don't like about it, what's going to happen is staff, land use staff at city council will and their attorneys, they're going to be going through this and they will likely make some modifications. The or or it might be voted down, probably not. There's probably going to be some modifications. And what those modifications are will be directly related to what they hear from the constituency, right? This is where the people's voice is heard much more than at the city planning commission because the city planning commission, they're not elected, right? They don't have to be responsive to the people like your council members are. So if you have opinions, Bernadette, uh, contact your council member. And ju uh, just to, to emphasize what you just said, George, I think this is the most critical part of of, uh, of this conversation, and sort of like you know actionable uh, piece for uh, for our viewers. Um, this is the inflection point. This is where you, we, jointly, collectively, if we have some concerns, specific or broad, this is where we can make uh, a difference. Um, the council members will hear from uh, their constituents uh, and they will be receptive. Keep in mind that 2025 is an election year, so all the council members have to be elected or re-elected. Um, and uh, this is really something that they, they will be held accountable for. Um, so, you know, if you don't feel this, but like if you don't like the, this, this particular proposal, if you have objections to it, write to your council member. Now is the time to do it. And uh, it is really meaningful. So I uh, want to really stress that. All right, we'll take a couple more. Um, all right, so John Lobert, uh, I think there is a clear, I think it is clear that there is a deregulatory trend uh, it has strong academic support from economists and planners, notably Edward Glazer, who argues that the primary way to solve the housing crisis is by increasing the housing supply. I have no of no serious academic opposition to this view. If anyone on this panel knows, John wants to know. Laura, you're the academic here. <laughs> there is uh, serious academic opposition, there are serious uh, you know, empirical studies, and I would be happy to to share those if you would like to email me at my Hunter address, which is uh, available on the Hunter website. Um, yeah, no, I think it's, and I, I didn't want to say that I'm a huge deregulation fan. I didn't want to imply that one with my answer to the previous question. Um, and when it comes to, um, uh, when it comes to uh, the the idea that housing supply that that we have a supply crisis um, I d I do not agree with that I think we have a, a, an affordability crisis or a mismatch I guess as as Paul said um, and um, that that can be resolved um, with supply but not supply that is being uh, furnished by people who are concerned only with the return on investment that they're going to be getting so. Um, that's uh, in general. I, I, you know, this is get this is veering. This conversation has veered a couple of times into a discussion of uh, the housing proposals uh, part of the the city of yes. And um, I want to kind of stay in the lane of the economic <laughs> proposals. Uh, but I, you know, I think my my, uh, um, you know, the, I would have a different set of remarks if this was a proposal. If this was a panel on housing. And, and actually, thing... actually if, if we if we can uh, stay on the housing lane for a quick more uh, longer second, uh, just want to mention that uh, on May seventh, uh, the City Club is going to organize an event, uh, a webinar uh, with Patrick Condon, uh, who is a uh, professor with the uh, University of British Columbia, 
and uh, Cameron Murray, who is an economist uh, from uh, Australia. They are both actually very serious and, you know, they published books very recently. Uh, and uh, they are of the view that the supply and demand theory does not work. Uh, so I'm very, very excited that, you know, we're, we're going to have this international perspective, you know, from very uh, well-established, uh, you know, members of academia who can actually, uh, you know, bring a different light. Uh, and, you know, may maybe we'll invite Laser and who knows, maybe he'll say yes. But stay tuned, uh, May 7th. Yeah, and if I could add a little bit about the whole deregulation trend, I, I, um, I think that uh, retail and commercial are a fundamentally different animal because we don't we we, we don't live there. Um, in the end, it's a lower. It, it tends to be of lower priority to your average human, um, and. You know, I, I, I think that YIMBYism is going to be far less fierce when it comes to retail and commercial than it than it has turned out to be for, for residential. Um, I think, you know, in, in answer to your question, George, you had asked about central business districts and, you know, and how, how you know, what kinds of amusements, for instance, should or should not be permitted there. You know, I will say I'm inclined in general when it comes to retail, food, beverage, entertainment, uh, to allow more in a central business district because while there are no doubt conflicts, it's kind of like living underneath the flight path of an airport and then complaining about the noise, right? It, you know, it's like you live in a central business district. Um, you know, there's benefits to being close to everything and there's drawbacks. <laughs> um and more to the point, I think at this point in time, given that central business districts are, you know, facing some manner of existential crisis, to, to let the market come up with, with some possible solutions, some of which will be a little zany, um, others which might actually gain traction in a more enduring sort of way, I think there, there might be more advantages to that than, than, than not. Um, okay. Just a thought. Uh, yeah, no, it's a good comment. Yeah. All right, uh, Layla, we're we're after eight. Um, yes. Yeah. So um, maybe our panelists want to give some closing statements uh, before we say goodbye. Uh, maybe uh, starting with you, Michael. Mm, thank uh, you, your... Layla. Well, well, first of all, uh, thanks to, to Layla and the City Club for having us. Um, uh, I've enjoyed this, and, and it's obviously an important topic. Um, you know, I, I think in my uh, closing remarks, you know, I, we've said a lot today. Um, we've talked about a lot of different issues. Um, you know, I think whenever retail is involved, you know, the tricky part about it is that we all do it. Um, we, we all buy goods, we all buy services, uh, m a lot of us caffeinate, uh, a lot of us drink, uh, most of us go to the movies from time to time, so on and so forth. And so we all have opinions about it and it might seem easier and, 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 and more straightforward than it in fact is. And I think, um, you know, there's actually a lot of nuance and complexity, which, uh, City of Yes, to its credit, has addressed in some respects, but not as much in others. Uh, and so, you know, I think overall, there's a lot that's good about this. Um, but especially with retail, you know, the, the devil is 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 in the details. Um, and there are a few details which still give me some cause for, for concern. So, that that's that's what I'll say. I, I um, but thanks a lot again for having us, and um, thanks to my fellow panelists. Thank you, Michael. And yeah. turning to Laura. Um, yes, thank you for having us. I think uh, I would just reiterate my former comment that the zoning code that we have is an accretion of you know many uh, special interest. Uh, acts actions over over many years it, it is not uh 
I kind of take exception to Paul's um, notion that it's that only uh, ordinary people benefit from regulation and only <laughs> uh, businesses pay for it. I think it's a little bit more complex than that. Um, you know, so so I think it's it's good that that we are in a process where we are looking at commercial and industrial zoning for the first time in many decades and trying to um you know to understand how it can serve the needs of the people of New York in it in an economy that looks really really different than it did in 1961 um and i think it's i'm glad that we're having discussion forums like this and i will echo Layla that i think people should definitely be uh, contacting their council people with their concerns um, but I don't think that that change is, uh, you know, of necessity. And we, we may be attached to the existing set of regulations in a way that um, prevents us from seeing like where there are opportunities to to adapt and move forward that would be that would benefit everybody in the city. Thank you, Laura. Uh, George, uh, do you, do you want to uh, give your closing moderator remark? Uh, before we say yeah, sure. let me let me say um, I think everybody thank you very much for participating in this it was great um, um, my final thoughts on this as somebody who's um, served a number of different community boards went to so many night meetings um, prepared so many materials trying to explain 1100 pages of zoning text to lay planners who serve on community boards it makes me think how did it get this way why do we plan? Why do we do it like this, right? If you go to other jurisdictions, they have a planning process, a comprehensive planning process with community engagement to develop a comprehensive plan. And that comprehensive plan is then used to inform the implementation tools of which include zoning, right? There's a connection between the plan and the zoning. And here, this was dropped on us with a ticking clock. And to the credit of the Department of City Planning, you know, they gave extra time to community boards for their for their comments, um, which was well used. They didn't have to do that, but they did. But it still wasn't enough, right? And and you know, the fact that it was, you know, essentially sprung out without the planning process that went before it. And and you know, as a way of, yeah, yes, this is about City of Yes for economic opportunity and details, but I would just like to ask people to think about how we plan and think about how we make land use decisions in this city. And why is it so different than how other places do it, right? It is so different. Um, and And who does that benefit, right? Does it benefit you and me? Who is that benefiting that difference? And and I don't, you know, Laura, you you gave a shout out to people at, at Department of City Planning, and there are lots of really great, smart people there who do really, really good work, but they work for people, right? Who are they working for? And how are they given their direction? And that's why I, I just that's that's I just want you to think about that and to think about how in the future this process could be better. That's it. Yeah, thank you so much, George. And uh, you know, I think it's that this comment is very timely given that we are going to embark on the city of yes for housing uh, opportunity, which is another uh, beast of a uh, you know zoning uh, tax change uh, that also seems to take the approach of you know one size fits all. So uh, stay tuned as uh, <laughs> you know that this whole uh, you know zoning change is is uh, you know a, a work in in progress uh, under uh, this administration. Well, you know I want to really thank uh, all of you participants who actually joined us tonight. You were uh, close to eighty who who joined us for uh, this uh, this webinar. Uh, we, we know that, you know, we're competing with lots of uh, other opportunities, so we really, really uh, love it when we see such a large turnout to, to our events, and we want to thank you for that. It's, uh, it's really significant. I um, want to remind everyone that uh, this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel. You can follow us on our social media. Uh, all the presentations that were given by the panelists will be available uh, on our website. 
Um, I want to thank our panelists, uh, Michael Byrne, Laura uh, Wolf Powers, and uh, Paul Graziano uh, for participating and you know bringing some uh, you know thought provoking uh, ideas to us. It's uh, it's great when we get to you know exchange ideas. Um, I want to thank George James for doing a terrific job moderating this conversation and bringing your expertise. You are, as I said, you know, one of the most knowledgeable uh, persons in New York City on uh, the zoning resolution and the driving principles behind uh, zoning and planning. So uh, much appreciated. Um, I want to thank uh, Juan Rivero uh, of the City Club, who uh, was uh, behind actually organizing this event. Uh, it was really uh, terrific work that, that went into uh, planning this and much appreciation to Juan. Uh, and, you know, in the end, I really want to thank New Yorkers. Um, I was just blown away to see that, uh, you know, this hearing on Monday lasted seven hours. And some people would say, oh my God, seven hours, this is horrible. This is great. This is who we are. We are really driven and passionate about zoning, land use and planning, and we should because it affects us in our daily lives. It affects our, uh, uh, you know, today, it affects us tomorrow. Planning is actually one of the most consequential uh, aspects of uh, New York City policy. So thank you to New Yorkers for being so passionate, so involved, and please continue to participate to the, these hearings, reach out to your community boards, to your council members, to your representatives, your assembly members, senators, uh, our voices matter. And, uh, you know, I think it's really energizing to the, see this level of uh, participation. So with all of that, once again, thank you so much. And I wish you a wonderful evening. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye now.